Moses for the Old Testament, Elijah, who comes in spiritual form as John the Baptist for the New Testament. See, and I believe these are the two witnesses that you read about later on in Revelation. Moses brought the law. He introduced the law to the 12 tribes of Israel. Elijah introduced Christ, who is the New Testament, to the 12 apostles in the form of John the Baptist when he introduced Christ. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And he said that, and they asked Jesus later, what about Elijah was, who was to come? He said, you can't see Elijah standing right there? He's John the Baptist. There's been no greater man born about, uh, no greater person born amongst men, greater than John the Baptist. Yet I say unto thee, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. It's, the, it's about the, 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 now the administration of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, which, which doesn't get, do away with the law. It fulfill, he fulfills the law. This is why Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the law. I fulfill the law. He said, the law can't make you perfect. Why? Because the law only engenders wrath, judgment. But the perfect law of liberty, the Holy Spirit, can make you perfect in that you have now a nature that expresses love. If This is so simple. And look how many people are tied up in all these ramblings and all these endless strivings about the law versus grace, etc., etc. Why is that? Because they won't get filled. They won't let the Holy Spirit take over to liberate, liberate their minds from thinking legalistically and they return back to the vomit. The Bible says like a dog returning to his vomit and like a, a, and like a, like a, a, and a pig to wallowing in the mire again, wallowing in the, in the mud. They go back to the law. They go back to the governance of the law to try to confine and restrict the old man when in fact the New Testament and the law of the Spirit does away with the old man. I mean, who would want to live forever struggling with things that are binding them as opposed to having that whole nature dismissed and there's no inner struggle anymore? Who wants to be an alcoholic struggling with alcoholism? A drug addict struggling with drugs? A porno addict struggling not to touch that key on the internet or click that mouse to go to a porno site. Man, who wants to live in the inner agony of trying to strive with sin inside of you when the, when the, the scapegoat takes the sin away? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's the difference between somebody under law and under grace. And the reason why they're so antagonistic, they see one tree that they believe in and they fight for at the expense of the liberation of the whole forest. I'm holding on to this one tree, and you're a wanderer through the whole forest. You're free, and they are bound. That's the struggle. That's the only struggle you got down here, bound people and free people. And you know, by nature, what does he say? He says that every person that belongs to Hagar is a child of the bun woman. And, and, and automatically you get what? Animosity and, 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 and turmoil and strife between the, the child of the bun woman and the child of the free woman. Ishmael and Isaac butted heads. He says, but the, the, the children of the free woman are, are more in number in that Jerusalem above is free. So when you actually ascend from this realm and get into a realm of the spirit, Man, you're liberated, and bound people won't like you. Think about it. Everybody bound to sin and performing sin, they have their little uh, arena that they worship, and if you don't conform to what they worship, they don't like you. That's what, go anywhere. That's the only conflict you'll find. What another person worships, you don't. I don't like you. Have you heard the latest record by Jay-Z? I don't listen to Jay-Z. That, that, that foolishness, I don't listen to that. I don't like you. I like Jay-Z. I'm a fan of his. I'm a fanatic for him, is what they're saying. But what about sports? I love this team. I could care less about that junk. You don't like sports? 
tension because they're into something you're not into because you've been delivered from it. See, a free person can go to a football game, but they don't go home depressed and, 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 and have to get liquored up because of the game. They're so, they're so cast down from the loss. I got to get liquored up tonight because I just I can't take the fact that we lost. I'm about to lose my mind. Atlanta suffering through days and weeks of depression because the Braves failed to win the, 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 uh, the World Series for years and people going back home just depressed and job performances going down and people just messed up for weeks and years and it's folks right now still hadn't recovered from 1995 or 1994 or whatever loss in the, I just remember what the decision Bobby Cox made. I can't believe he, they just, what difference does it make, man? No, no, you don't understand. And they don't find a person that sees it like they see it. Look at all the flags flying out of, out of all these car windows now, headed to the college football game. They'll go out, the college football game starts at 7 in the evening. They get up at 8 o'clock in the morning and go and tailgate and start cooking out and drinking beer. And so by the time 7 o'clock rolls around, I'm liquored up and crazy and I got my face painted purple, green, and white. And I'm in the stands yelling like a wild man. But you don't worship that, so I don't like you. That's the conflict. It's two natures at war reflected in Cain and Abel, Ishmael and Isaac, Jacob and Esau, the first Adam, the second Adam, who is Christ. The old man versus the new man, Ephesians chapter 4. Take off the old man, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new man. So it's a, it's a regeneration process. Remember this if you remember nothing else in life. After salvation, you need regeneration. After you come to Christ, you need regeneration. Your genes have to be now cleansed because you were defiled genetically by the infiltration of what the Bible calls unclean spirits which made you unclean so now you need regeneration with whose genes Jesus's genes you need Jesus genes you need regeneration that's conformity to the son of God he's making you over into a son of God that the Holy Spirit will house the Holy Spirit fills every manifested son so you need regeneration first of all or regeneration so that the Holy Ghost can fill you. Once God gets to a time period where there are humans who have been regenerated, he's going to fill those humans, manifest the Son of God, and you'll get the book of Revelation turning on because he was after that type of a human from Jump Street. Remember the clay, I think it's in Jeremiah, that was defiled and marred in the, in, in the workman's hands? He had to start over with a whole new lump of clay. What's happening? He made Adam. Adam was infiltrated by Satan. He was genetically infiltrated and became a mutated life type that God didn't create. God, through Jesus Christ, crucified the mutant. Now he's regenerating or regenerating another kind of a person to displace or replace Adam and start over again with, the, with a new vessel, a regenerated vessel that Jesus' blood is able to cleanse from all unrighteousness, clean from the, the defiling elements of the unclean spirits, raise those people up, fill them with the Holy Spirit as opposed to the unholy spirit, and then sit them out here as God's finished work, a regenerated man, a new species, he makes out of Israel and the church, one new man. And he brings, what did he say he brings from that one new man? Peace. He, he gets rid of the enmity. He makes a regenerated man, both of the Israelites and the, the, the other, other people on earth, what they call the, 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 the Jew and the Greek. But he's talking about people outside of Israel. Israel was just a conduit to get the all people on earth. But when he regenerates all of his sons, and, his sons and daughters, they'll be in the image of Jesus Christ. The Holy Ghost will fill them, and he'll have manifested sons. And I believe 
that these manifested sons are the trigger for the apocalypse. The devil doesn't decide to start the apocalypse. God triggers the apocalypse when he fills the, the remnant church with himself. And the, what you see in the apocalypse of Revelation is the response of the devil to God moving. God doesn't respond to the devil. God is the catalyst. He's the authoritative sovereign person on the offense. He's not cowering in a corner because of what the devil's doing. God is going into war to take what he wants to take by force. These things must be. See, so it's not about the devil doing anything. You just hang around long enough and watch. When God makes up his jewels, he says, and he begins this work he's going to do, the Bible calls it his strange work. Man, stand back. Because it'll be an invincible force that no one can stop. And, which, and you, got a, you got a remnant people who are aligning themselves right now with this strategic cleansing for the infilling. And the rest of the church world that's bound to religion will not and cannot understand those people. So don't try to make them. All right, now, that's the, that sets the stage. Revelation chapter 4. You see these elders. I believe there are 24 elders, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles of the Lamb. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And you're looking at basically the cherubims, these four beast creatures that are around the throne that glorify God and worship God and crowd, holy, holy, holy Lord all day and night. And when they do, the Bible says, the 24 elders bow down and cast their, throne, their crowns down before him, showing what? That they're submissive to the Lamb, the ruling entity, the, the real ruler, the King, Jesus Christ. By them taking their crowns off and, and casting them down, they're saying, but we submit our will to the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Now, seven spirits of God around the throne reflected in the seven candlesticks. The seven candlestick in the um, Old Testament, I think it's called a menorah, that they burned the seven-pronged candlestick. Those are the seven spirits of God. You'll find them, I think it's in Isaiah, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom. These are the seven spirits of God as he manifests himself different ways. Now, that sets the stage. What we're getting to is a visible kingdom, Jesus in throne, 24 elders, Ruling council, I believe, of 420 elders, you'll find later on in Revelation, which is a, multi a multiplication of 12, 65 times 12 is 420. So you got now, the kingdom is always reflected in the number 12. 12 Old Testament patriots, 12 apostles, a multiplication of 12 for the general ruling council, 65 times 12, that's the number of the kingdom. That's why you see 12 months in a year. That's why the day is divided into 12 daylight hours and 12 nighttime hours. You can go on and on to number 12. It shows the rulership in the kingdom of God. The reason why the day is split into 12 daylight hours and basically 12 afternoon or evening hours is because the duality of both kingdoms is always shown forth on earth while Satan...